Let's have a word of prayer and then we're going to jump to 1 Samuel. Lord, we're grateful for your word. Uh, we stop in the middle of the day. There's a lot of things on our minds. There's things right now we probably would like to do. And um, I pray you'd help us to just in the next 30 minutes to give it full attention, uh, have ears to hear. And um, Lord, we, 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 uh, we trust that the worship that we've given you in song has, has been a beautiful thing to you and you saw in our hearts um, a, a bended knee um, or not, not anything that is even pharisaical just the truth that we want to give our lives away and um, I pray you found that to be true here and Lord we submit ourselves to your word we, we ask that um, you, would, you would do something that only you can do and that is make sense of things and your word is truth, so I pray it would reveal that to us this morning. In Christ's name, amen. If you want to head over to 1 Samuel chapter 13, we're going to get there soon. Um, and, uh, but I, I want to walk through a little bit of David's life. So we're going to cover some ground, which is a huge feat, because uh, for 30 minutes or less than that, actually, uh, to try to cover chapter 17 all the way through basically the end of, of 1 Samuel is going to be tough. But because I'm pretty sure you know a lot about David's life, I don't think it's going to be that challenging. So if you would stick through and just follow it. I want to walk through some highlights of David's life as um, I have been profoundly uh, ministered to by the God who David knew. And I need to know, I need to know better. And I think that's true for every one of us. But... Um, and as I think through David, and in many trials he had, what came to my mind is something that is really present and even in our own culture here at Clearwater Christian College. You know, we're praying for a couple of our students. You know, Ashley Diaz potentially going through a surgery soon. You know, Colin DeHate going through a surgery. And, and these are radical changes in people's lives. Which you, one used to be mobile, not mobile. All the people in, in their lives, I think of many of you that were our teammates and the coaches. And there's some truths in God's Word that are so directional for us. So if you would open your heart and your mind to the Lord this morning, I think you'll find direction and healing. If you think of David's life, you have to think of King Saul. And, uh, you know, in 1 Samuel 13, you learn something about King Saul. He comes to be, to be king at, um, at probably about age 30. And the scriptures say he reigned for about 42 years. Why did he become king? Because Israel wasn't satisfied with the one true king. They wanted just like everyone else had. And, and you know, before you and I are going like, yeah, those Israelites, you know how they are. Never satisfied. You know, if we look in our own hearts, we're kind of the same way. Not always satisfied in Christ. Never really satisfied. We, he tells us you can't serve two masters, but what do we do? We really try to do that. Um, and uh, so we're a lot like Israel. But they get a king. They get King Saul. Saul quickly learns that he's not sovereign. In chapter 13, eight, verses 8 through 14, he learns this because he's, he's impatient. He needs to offer sacrifice and he won't wait for the priest. The people are about ready to spread. And he's afraid of losing the battle and all this. So he just gets a little bit anxious. And he goes ahead and he does what he shouldn't be doing. And that is offering the sacrifice, the burnt offering for Israel, which was the priest's role. And he, he gets rebuked and he realizes, Saul, you're not sovereign. I mean, you may be king, but you don't have rule and reign over everything. You don't have all rights. Saul goes on and he, he as king, he makes some decisions and ones that perhaps he regrets. You know, you come to, to 1 Samuel chapter 14 and Saul makes this oath and he asks his men to all make the same oath. And the oath is, is that we're going to go out to battle and we're going to defeat them and no one's going to eat anything until we're done. Lest you be put to death. Well, guess who wasn't in that meeting, didn't hear it? It was Jonathan, his son. And they go off to battle and some of them catch up to Jonathan and, and he just eats a little bit. He just needs it. They're all getting weary some. And he eats. The battle's over and Jonathan has to answer for his actions, which he did not know of. And Saul sticks to his guns and he's like, we're going to put him to death. And he calls his men to put his son to death. And they wouldn't do it. And they spared his life. And um, Saul, making a decision, again, 
sees himself as not necessarily sovereign or all wise. But then in Samuel 15, Saul disobeys God's command to just annihilate the Amalekites. Can you imagine that, that command? You're, you're the army, um, and I tell you for the first time, hey, uh, we're going to go out and, and we're going to wipe out the Amalekites. And if you knew this history, you would be like, yeah, it's about time, and God's going to be with us. These, these people were, were wicked. They were, they were ruthless. The fact, the way they responded to, to the women and the children and the weak ones in our nation, man, you're livid. This is our moment. And he says, we're going to annihilate everything. And the reality was, is they didn't do that. They took the best of the, of the cattle. They kept the king. And, and here, 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 you, here you have the priest who comes and he's livid. Why? Because God says, Saul hasn't obeyed me. And Saul kind of plays off that idea of, I was, as you hear the goats in the background. And at that, that moment, he is informed that so will your, your kingdom will be taken away from you. And then Hagag is hacked to pieces. Because again, Saul's seeing some of his actions. He's seeing, he's striving to lead it the way he wants to lead. And Saul is struggling. And then you find David coming along the scene. And God looks for one after his own heart. And, and David... In this moment, and in front of his family, in chapter 16, verse 13, David is privately anointed. Now, that doesn't mean that David's on the throne yet, but he's privately anointed. David knows something about his future that rarely many of us will ever know. How does he handle that? Especially knowing the future a little bit is not always that easy. Sometimes we wish for it. But when you get it sometimes, you're like, um, I don't know if I want to deal with that. How does David handle with this? Well, David's still doing his thing. But Saul's having some problems in chapter 16, and he needs to be ministered to, so he asks for someone who can play an instrument. And they know that David can, so he calls in David, and David has this gig. He goes in, and he plays his harp, and the king loves it. His spirit is changed. What does he get as a reward? He gets to be an armor bearer. One of Saul's armor bearers. Despite though all this, he goes and he's continuing to be you know, part of his family. And um, he wasn't invited to this particular battle because in chapter 17, which I told you to head towards, um, he comes from home from his dad's direction to go see his brothers as they're hearing this giant shout out to Israel and defying Israel's God calling for one warrior to come out as he basically spits at God. And David kind of comes in, and you know the story so well, and it's, there's something about David that, that is, is unique. I, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the Bible uh, miniseries. Um, I haven't watched through it entirely. I've watched a few clips, and unfortunately I don't have time to show you many clips, but there's King Saul, and, uh, and then you have young, young David, who there, and he, it's, it's remarkable what it is about David when you, what, that you see him being willing to do something that is, is amazing. And I know a lot of times we use this text, and sometimes we're thinking that we're going to be, if we learn from this truth of this text, we're going to be giant slayers, and, 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 and I, I get all that. But if you notice what happens in verse 26, notice what is said. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, So shall be done to the man who kills him. What's David all up in arms about? David is seeing a man, a mortal man, defying the Almighty God. And despite accusations of people thinking about his motives being a bit awry, David is passionate about there's only one true God. Who dares, no, how, no matter how big you may be, defy the one living God? And, and David, in that response, you see David displaying something that I think is so profound for each one of us. And it's not a truth that you and I can't respond to or live out in our lives. And that is the number one, the one thing I think we learned from David's life demonstrates how an accurate view of God 
and his sovereignty will increase one's faith to do the very thing for God that many others are afraid to do. I mean, I think sometimes we look at, at David and we almost wonder if he's superhuman. I kind of look at them that way. I was like, man, one day I'm going to get to heaven, I'm going to meet this guy, and I'm going to learn some things that I never learned before. But the story isn't about David. The story is about God. And the reality is, is our attention needs to go more about who is the God that he was, he was so passionate about? Who is this God that he was willing to go up against a giant when no one else will? What made it happen for him? And the reality is, is he saw God for who he was. He understand who he, his sovereignty. King Saul wasn't. No one else was. This great Philistine giant is not. And as a response to that, he, his faith has increased to the point that he will do something that many others will not do for God. What is it going to take for you and me to deal with the fear of man in our lives? What is it going to take for you in a world that doesn't buy in to one God? Maybe even would look at your faith and say, you are weak, you need God as a crutch. What will it be for you and for me when we get in those moments, when we stand alone? What will motivate us? It's the same thing that motivated David, that our God has never changed. The sovereignty of God, this knowing God and who he is, increases our faith to the very thing for God that many others are afraid to do. And what David remembered? Small triumphs when facing the current challenge. Look at verse 37. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear, will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. You know the moments when we struggle with our faith, or the moments when we need to look back at the very hand of God in our life in the past. That's what David did. David was motivated by what? The demotion of this one and only living God by the Philistine giant. That motivated him. How dare you defy the one living God? So who cares this much? Who cares this much? David does. David cares that much. You know, it's not true. Not just David. It's the same person that is willing to forsake father, mother, and even his own self and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the person that cares so much. They are enwrapped and enthralled with who God really is and their relationship with him. But as you go on through David's life, of course, that's a great, job. That's a great feat. His name now all of a sudden is known amongst many people. In chapter 18, David gets a song written about him. And that's not, uh, probably won't happen to you and me, but it is what happened to David, and it's, and it's chanted in comparison to Saul's great victories. And it says in chapter 18 and verse 9, if you want to turn over to chapter 18, verse 9, and Saul eyed David from that day on. All of a sudden, this plot starts to thicken. All of a sudden, David now, he just, he just saved Israel. You'd think he'd be like Saul's favorite. And instead, he has his eye, and Saul looked on David with suspicion. One translation wrote it. So David's playing a soothing harp in chapter 18. And all of a sudden, the response to the soothing harp this time is a javelin being thrust at him. Now, I know a lot of times in your flannel graphs you've probably seen in Sunday school or whatever else, you probably, um, you kind of look at it and go, oh, he just missed him kind of a thing. But I, I think there's probably a little more going on here. You keep in mind, these are the two greatest warriors of Israel. Saul wasn't just put as king for no apparent reason. Sure, his stature was great, but he was a warrior. This is something that you don't go into battle and come out regularly alive just on accident. You better be really good and be very good at what you do. And I gotta imagine that King Saul had a pretty good aim. I also got to believe that God had gifted David with some ability to maneuver. But at the same time, you see the hand of God preserving his life. Now, this doesn't just happen one time. As the story goes on, it happened two times that very mo in that very uh, episode, and he escapes with his life. 
What happens to David because of that? Well, he got away, but consequently David was exiled to be the commander of a military army in chapter 13. This only gave, or verse 13, sorry, of chapter 8. This only gave Israel and Judah more reason to have greater affection for David. So in his punishment, he gets actually blessed. And then David takes Saul's dare. Saul's still trying to take David down. He takes his dare to become his son-in-law. David accepts the challenge in chapter 18 and is victorious and he marries Saul's, Saul's daughter Michal. And as a result, Saul is now afraid of David because now David's actually part of the family. David continually, it says in chapter 18 to verse 30, continually is proven to be wiser than all Saul's servants in battle. That's why I'm saying this guy was talented. I mean, he had the, the hand of God on his life. But he was not some weak warrior. And David here continues to be exalted amongst other men. Consequently, Saul did something else. Chapter 19, verse 1. Saul puts a death sentence on David's life. And he says to all of his, all of his servants to kill David. If you think now what's happening here, David, he saves Israel. He helps out King Saul with his problem by playing his harp. He's pretty gifted musically. He escapes a few, a few jab, uh, uh, spears thrown right at him. He gets stuck to being a commander of a military army and does extremely well. As a matter of fact, not that he was successful by happenstance, everyone knows he's brilliant. He's a ter terrific warrior. And now all of a sudden he marries into Saul's family. Saul is getting extremely nervous and now he's afraid, it says in chapter 18, verse 29, now Saul is afraid of David. Jonathan then reminds his father, hey dad, um, let's think about this for a little while. Here he saved your nation from destruction, being handed over to the Philistines. Do you remember that? And he reminds him of all the great things that he had done for him. Saul kind of comes to his senses and kind of backs off a little bit. So then, all of a sudden, what does David get as reward? He gets another gig back into the king's, in the king's room with, by playing his harp. Only to get what? One more javelin thrown at him. And he eludes that javelin. And he leaves, and Saul is, is extremely upset, and he calls for his servants to go kill him in his home. His wife, Saul's daughter, tells him of this whole plot and enables him to escape in the middle of the night, and David flees. David doesn't come to the king's table when he's supposed to. And what happens, Jonathan covers for him, and now Saul is even angry with his son Jonathan in chapter 20 of 1 Samuel. So David's on the run. He sees the priest in Limelech, and he's wondering why David's alone. And he, David just wants five loaves of bread, and he doesn't really have it, so he, he goes to the altar, and he takes the bread there. And David, David, I think he took, if I remember correctly, David ended up taking um, some of Goliath's armor, and he fled. Saul can't find him. He's hanging out under a tree with some of his, his, his captain of, of, his, of his military. And, David, and Saul says, I've given you leadership over thousands of people. You're not talking to me. It almost seems like you're, you're covering for this guy, David. What's going on? I've rewarded you. I've given so much to you. Why won't you speak? And finally someone says, well, I did hear, the gentleman's name is Doeg, I think it's D-O-E-G, so I think that's how you pronounce it, and he says to him, I remember seeing David. And the end result of that is Saul calls for his men to, to, to kill 85 priests. No one would do it, but this guy, Doeg, would do it. David now looks back at his life and he's seeing what's happened. Now 85 men have, have been killed just by his presence alone. Saul is serious about going after, after David. Think about it. Three javelins. A death sentence. What does Saul do? He goes on an all-out mission to search for David. It says in chapter 23 and verse 14, Saul searches every day for David and his men. 
And if you if you ever watch some of these miniseries, whether it's Netflix or just something you're, you're, uh, something that's live that's coming up every week, there's always a plot. Now, I, I kind of like some of the miniseries where the story is this guy is trying to either prove his innocence or he's trying to elude the enemy. And every series just or someone's trying to to save their own life. And every series you're they're inching closer and closer. And the series goes on a second series, and then it's the third year, and you're like, when is are we going to learn the answer? When is he going to either escape or when is he going to prove his innocence and here it's like the same story except for in chapter 23 verses 26 26 to 27 David is about caught only to have someone rush in and say Saul we're under attack and just when he was entrapped Saul has to leave his men it's like he was just so close to being captured and Saul leaves what does David do he goes to the wilderness of Engedi. And he hides out in a cave. Look at chapter 24, if you would. You know the story well. He's in this cave. I don't know how big this cave is. Uh, here's a picture of... Um, if I can get to it. This is a picture of the wilderness. There's lots of caves. It had to have been a cave that Saul can get into. And... Um, the scripture says in, in, in uh, 1 Samuel 24 uh, that uh, I think the King James Version uses it kind of um, uh, politely and says it covers his legs. And that's just an euphemism for yeah, he evacuated the bowels. So you get the idea, right? Um, Saul needs to use the bathroom. Happens to be the same cave that David and his men are. And it must have been a pretty big cave or at least a lot of channels. And it just happens to be where David is so close that he can touch the hem of Saul's robe. And his men have a conversation. As if you read this, this text, you're kind of like, how did they have this conversation? Like, was Saul whistling so they can have it? I don't know. I really don't know. It's amazing because there's a whole conversation. And the conversation goes something like this. Now is the appointed time God has given you, David, to take the very hand to take the life of Saul. He has been chasing you. Remember the three javelins? You remember the death sentence? You remember this manhunt that you're currently in for months being chased by this man? Now is your, is your moment. So what does David say? And the men of David said to him in verse 4, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart st struck him. It struck him. He cut off his part of his robe. Why? Because he had cut off a corner of of Saul's robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. At this point in the story, I'm almost ready to say, are you for real? I mean, seriously. I've never been in a situation like David. I can only imagine. And are you serious? I, I, I have to believe he was more serious than I could possibly imagine with having all his wise men, men who would give their life for him, not take their wisdom, and, and despite all the counterculture message he was given, for, for David to do what he does, it only makes sense in one way. It only makes sense when David understand who God was. He understand the sovereignty of God, and that reigned in his heart. So despite the counterculture messages, what did David what did this awareness of view of God and an accurate view of God and His sovereignty do? Well, one, it increases one's faith to do the very thing for God that many others are afraid to do. But what else did it do? If, I, if you see in, in this chapter, you'll notice it humbled you to the point where you'll deny your natural fleshly desires and embrace who? God's. That's the reality of the relationship that we have with God. That's the sanctificational process. For you to deny yourself, for me to deny myself, is a supernatural event. That does not happen without the work of God in my life. And it certainly won't happen with a renewing of my mind. And in David's life, here he's humbled to the point where he says, the Lord's anointed, yeah, the guy who's, who's out to kill you. And he's humbled by not, something o overtook him. And it was his understanding of the one true God. Despite a countercultural message, even your motives and intentions matter. Isn't that amazing? Even his intentions, he felt 
guilty that he had cut and put his hand on God's anointed's robe. And he's overwhelmed with, with guilt. How does David make this decision? How does he make this decision? Proverbs 14, 26 says, In the fear of the Lord there is strong confidence. I like how John MacArthur defines fear. It's the state of mind in which one's own attitudes will, feelings, deeds, and goals are exchanged for God's. And it brings you and me back to the question, do I really fear God? Do I really know God to that intimate detail to where I would stand up for God when no one else will? Have you ever been humbled by God's presence? Have you ever been humbled to the degree where you respond in a way where it denies the natural fleshly desires? Have you ever seen that happen in your life? It only happens because of, of, of God's activity in our life. And then as the story goes on, and I know our time is up, and I'll probably end with just these, this one here. But in chapter 24, in verses 8 through 15, notice what happens. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave, called after Saul, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. And I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. Now just for a second, stop as we read this, this next few verses. Do you get what's happening? David doesn't know the future. Okay, so he's in the cave. And he could take Saul's life. And he remembers the Lord's hand on King Saul's life, and he doesn't. Did he know what's coming next? No. As a matter of fact, he got guilty over it, and he goes, and it's like it's, like it's just happening live. And he goes out of the cave, and he says, he, he gives himself up, basically. He says, I'm right here. He's been hunting him, and he says, I'm right here. And you see what's playing out here in verse 13, or verse 12. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancient says, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea, may the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my case, my cause, and deliver me from your hand. And as soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice, and he wept. You know, God calls us to bring honor to the leaders in your life because God has placed them there. And that's the, that's the other aspect, I think, of God's sovereignty that only believers will respond that way with. And I'm going to skip to number four. Acknowledge God's hand in rebuke when you are an elite, when, even when you're a leader. It doesn't matter who you and I are. You notice what Saul does? He's rebuked. And I'm, I am just so humbled by looking at chapter, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 1, how David responds when he learns of Saul's death. You think maybe he'd crack. At one point, you start to see this guy is just as human. And what does he do? He kills the guy who killed King Saul in the battlefield. And he mourns for, his, for Saul and Jonathan. See, the reality is if we have an accurate view of God and his sovereign hand, there will be things that will take place in our life. It's kind of like, it's kind of like even in worship. Let's talk to our God right now. He's alive and well. Let's go live for him. My life is completely yours. And, and, and you may be there sitting going, I don't get all these things. These are supernatural things. They really are. There are passions in you that only because of, the, of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I, 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 when I think of this text and I think of David's life, I look at my circumstances and I wonder, do I respond in a cave moment of life the way I ought to? I was encouraged, and I, I think I put the scripture up here. I was, I was just chatting with Colin, and I don't know all that's going on in his life, but I got a chance to just, ch just text him a little bit. And um, I asked him how he was doing, and, and uh, sorry as I clicked through here. And I'll end with this. 
He says, this is a verse that is very healing to me. I want to read it as we close. Sorry, the light's kind of reflecting. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all compassion, comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. But the things that are unseen are eternal. In your cave moment of life are the moments when those Sunday school answers, we know the sovereignty of God, we know about God's goodness and truth, those are the moments where what you really believe is seen. I don't know if you're in a cave moment running around in life, but would you trust the sovereign hand of God? Because when you do, those are some of the things that come out. As you saw in Dave, let us pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Help us now. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to, to know your word better. Some of us need to spend more time just reading to understand who you are more. Not just to, to feel like we've gotten our devotions checked off, but to just know you because our minds need to be renewed. So, Lord, we're thankful for this text. Help us this day, we ask in Christ's name. Amen.